Hello, everyone. I'm uh, Daniel Bell, and uh, my, my talk is uh, Zelta, a safe and powerful approach to ZFS replication. And um, I'm actually talking a lot about my approach to ZFS replication. My uh, suite of tools is, is uh, Zelta, but I'm going to be talking about what I think are some of the fundamental building blocks of getting uh, good replication in a way that um, is versatile and that everybody can use. So a little bit about me. Um, I've been a, a BSD sysadmin for uh, 25 years, and I stopped using BSD for about five or five or ten of those, and uh, ended up about uh, um, in 2019. I wanted to try, uh, and this sort of became more of my pandemic project to see if I could get my MSP clients um, into more of a hybrid cloud environment, uh, save some money, use cloud resources more efficiently, and use hosted uh, resources more efficiently. And what I came across is. Um, in 2019, uh, Beehive support for Windows started becoming, you know, essentially perfect for all of my needs. So the FreeBSD stack, ZFS, Beehive, and Jail uh, were basically perfect for anything that I needed to run. Um, and uh, I have a long experience. I started work doing tech on Wall Street. Um, so after that, I started my own thing in 2002. But uh, because of the type of clients that I have in New York City, um, I've had a focus on um, infrastructure efficiency because of the size of my small clients. Uh, needed everything to be as uh, as you know cheap and fast as possible. Uh, advanced storage and backups. All, all of my clients are obsessed with um, security and have uh, long retention policies. And then secu security, privacy, and regulatory compliance. I did some work for uh, some Y2K plans back in the day. So uh, that, that's still, that, that type of work um, I, I still have to deal with. And ZFS helps me a lot with that. Um, I'm sure everybody here has probably act, at least accidentally installed ZFS at some point. But I'll go through a few things that I love about it. Um, so first of all, it's a first class file system on FreeBSD for you know, 15-ish years. I think since 2012, um, we've been able to boot. Um, so, you know, it's a great it's a it's a great file system and uh, works perfectly well for for what we want, and uh, is also perfect right out of the box. FreeBSD can can make a pretty good uh, NAS or private cloud server. Um, it's an immense improvement over RAID, uh, and also economical because we just use host bus adapters. We don't need to use um, expensive RAID cards. Um, we don't have, uh, you know, it's easier to expand. There's, there's a million things better about that that I'm sure you could hear about in different talks. And then an incredible hierarchical volume manager, which is incredible because I can say, you know, um, uh, set the set a top data set to read only, and then all of the all of its children are automatically read only. Um, it's it's got some flexibility and power that you don't see in a lot of other file systems. And then most of what I'm going to be talking about today, it's robust uh, recovery and replication system. Um, and basically, <clears throat> if you're not doing block replication now, I mean, obviously there are a few situations. Uh, doing, doing, dealing with loose files or, or something like that. Sure, you want to use rsync or something like that. But 99% of the time, or at least 99% of the data out there, you want to do block replications. It's always going to be faster um, and uh, you know, more reliable in a million different ways. <clears throat> um, but... I have a complicated relationship with ZFS. We're still an item, but uh, there are a number of problems with it. Um, and, and most of these problems aren't in ZFS in particular. It's just the way it's, it tends to be deployed and a lot of the um, sort of culture around it. So I'm going to talk about some of, the, some of the issues that I feel like you're probably bound to run into when you're getting started with ZFS. Um, Number one, breaking booting. Now, this, this is way too easy. It's, it's just, uh, 
well, here, this is, this is about the easiest possible replication that you can come up with. All right, I want to snapshot. I'm going to snapshot recursively. I'm going to snapshot my boot drive because that's where I put my stuff. And then I'm going to do a replication. I'm going to do a recursive replication. So that's CFS send dash capital R. Most of you probably already know what's going to happen. We've replicated and we've created a time bomb. Um, the next time we reboot this system, what, which, which uh, it's going to replicate all those mount points and other properties of the Z root. And um, you know, the next time you boot, that could be five minutes from now, it could be the next day, uh, you're toast. And even better, you're toast and we don't know why you're toast. It's not going to tell you exactly what happened. So I think that this is probably something that's happened to a lot of ZFS users um, that, that, use a, that use a root. Of course, there's solutions to this problem, but um, the most intuitive action you can do, it could get you in trouble. Um, very much related to this, you can, you can hide files. I, I think that this pops up on, uh, on the FreeBSD Discord from time to time. Why is FreeBSD hiding my files? FreeBSD isn't hiding your files. Um, what's happening is, uh, you know, depending on the, the, the timing of snapshots and what you do with mount points, and again, this is, a, this is another mount point related issue. Um, I've created a couple of files here called Precious, but I've taken a snapshot in between those two. Um, so I'm going to do a send, and of course I want to keep my properties, so I'm doing a ZFS send minus P. Now which one's going to mount? I don't know. Um, <laughs> I've done experiments on different operating systems and, uh, and different things. Sometimes, uh, I, I don't know if it's, uh, I mean, typically I guess it's the, the, second, the second one ZFS knows about will be, um, uh, will be the one that ends up mounting. So here I've created Precious 2, but now I'm working on Precious 1. Now I'm working on the, the, the point of data before that. So what that means is that you can work sometimes on a home directory and the two diverge. So that's, a, you know, that, that's definitely a problem that I think a lot of people run into. Um, and then here's my absolute favorite uh, problem with, uh, with ZFS. And this has more to do with the culture around it than with a problem with ZFS in particular. <clears throat> because uh, there are lots of ways to avoid this particular problem. But uh, you can get into situations where you're destroying backup data. Now, here's a similar backup that I, that I did in one of the previous slides, except I now have 10 snapshots. I've taken 10 point in time snapshots so that I could roll back or clone any point um, for anything in this, uh, um, in this particular data set, which I've called Groovy. And I've backed it up to a, a pool called bpool slash Groovy. So I've, I've made a copy. I've made a replica of all, all 10 of those snapshots. Now, let's say I'm in a situation similar to what we just saw, and those two data, data sets diverge. Uh, the common practice for dealing with this problem is simply adding a minus capital F to your ZFS receive um, process, which means it will just blindly destroy whatever is on the, um, on the target. So, um, you know, there's this, so I, I put a little uh, casket here. There's a, there's a meme that, is, that tends to be connected with, uh, uh, you know, various toxic places on the uh, internet. Press F to pay respects. Well, I think the ZFS receive minus capital F is also a toxic meme <laughs> that I think that we can do away with, hopefully, uh, today. Um, so I just want to show how bad this can get. This is basically the exact same problem, except it's an incremental um, replication. But I've had to do a rollback operation um, on the previous data set. So again, same exact thing, ZFS receive minus capital F. Now, since I've done a rollback, it is going to nuke every single snapshot I have backed up. Now, we can call this a replica. We cannot call it a backup. If I talk to my clients in finance, in healthcare, uh, in law, in government, they will laugh at you if you say that this is a possibility on your backup. All right, so there's a few other things I hate about ZFS, um, but none of them quite so bad as that. There, there are some uh, complexities with learning how to use 
uh, permissions and property inherit inheritance. Um, for example, if you are working with CFS with an unprivileged user, which I highly recommend, there's, there's no downside um, uh, at this point. And, uh, but, but, you know, there's like little things you'll get, you'll get errors if you use ZFS create um, and uh, minus P, which allows you to create a, a number of file systems in a row. You don't have exactly the right permissions, even though you told it not to mount, it'll still give you errors about mounting and some other little uh, issues, issues like that. You might have to do a little fiddling with uh, system control, uh, system CTLs, sysctls to uh, get everything working exactly the way you want, unprivileged. Um, replicating clones is a little bit tricky. I'm going to talk a little bit more about this later when I, when I introduce uh, my script solutions to th these problems. And then replicating with important uh, features. You pretty much always need to replicate with capital L, so large blocks, E, lowercase c, that's compressed streams, and W, because you want to replicate a, uh, your encrypted CFS file systems. If you don't do those, then you're probably missing something or, or degrading uh, performance or degrading um, space efficiency, or you're recompressing things that you don't necessarily need to recompress. Now, there's good reasons, well, maybe not L and E, but there are good reasons not to um, replicate with certain features, but should those be the defaults? And shouldn't ZFS send and receive be able to um, predict what, what defaults are available between the two, uh, between the two systems? Um, so now I'd like to talk uh, a little bit about the popular ZFS management approaches. Um, now there's a, there's a pot for every lid for sure, um, but the, but you know, basically, I want to build standard extensions. I don't want to replace training on ZFS. If you want to learn ZFS, learn ZFS. Um, learning another appliance or a, or a program, you're, you're, what I feel is you're, you're sort of diverting the work to, to learning this thing. I mean, that goes for my script, too. And what we'll talk about my approach and why I, um, I think I'd like to do things a little bit differently. Um, so appliances and cloud-backed CFS can sometimes be inflexible and not cost efficient. Um, again, if you know what you're doing, you, you might need something like that. And then the, the common scripts and applications are very kitchen sink. They, they do it all. They'll replace cron. They'll replace SSH. Um, I don't think we need, need anybody um, tell, telling, telling you all how great SSH is. Um, but if you, if you use Command Master, if you use Proxy Jump, uh, it is an absolutely incredible streaming um, server. You don't need to you don't need to rewrite that. And under under some circumstances, I can think of reasons to to rewrite a a streaming server. For example, if you're skipping user land for a pipe, or using KTLS, or using other advanced features, there could be reasons to do that. But I don't think that the ZFS replication tools out there are actually uh, making use of these things. So we're adding some dependencies. We're c complicating um, recovery. Uh, and the internet is a chaotic place. So what I think we're looking for are, are tools that are extremely portable and provide uh, the basic building blocks of, uh, of replication. All right, so, so quickly, just to give you, give you an idea of my mindset, I'm going to go through a couple different uh, uh, ex uh, inspiring examples of simplicity and modularity. Uh, SysRC for editing the rc.conf on, on FreeBSD. It's incredible. It's, a, it's an awk tool that just helps you edit and helps you not shoot yourself in the foot when you're making changes. VM Beehive. This has ZFS features built into it. VM Clone, I use it every single day, practically. Um, I have a couple of VM templates. I need a clone. Uh, it does it. It has a migration tool built right in. It's fantastic. Um, so when dealing with, uh, uh, with VMs, and it just adds the kind of scaffolding you need to make it really, really easy to run VMs on FreeBSD. Uh, Bastille and other jail managers. There's a, there's a jail manager called um, uh, Jailer that, is, uh, uh, you know, that, that uses ZFS as sort of a first-class way to, to replicate in some of the same ways that VM Beehive does. 
Uh, ZFS Snap, it's a snapshot uh, naming and pruning system that, that works well. And uh, BE Admin. Now, BE Admin is a tool that lets you, basically makes it impossible for you to break a system when you make an upgrade. Because it takes a ZFS snapshot of your boot environment, and you can roll back right from the boot menu if anything goes wrong. It's incredible. And even better about BE Admin and why it's such an inspiration is because BE Admin became BE Control, which is in the FreeBSD base now. So someone went out and wrote this. Who, who wrote it? Who wrote BE Admin? It was Vermidin. What's his real name? Okay, look up the wonderful authors of, of uh, <laughs> the wonderful admins of. Uh... <laughs> but the point here is that there was a great script, a great set of scripts, similar to what I'm trying to do. And a lot of those features, or all those features, are now in FreeBSD base, um, something that everybody has immediate access to with no dependencies whatsoever. Um, so I'm trying to uh, get back to basics here. And here are the building blocks that I think every ZFS script should have, or ZFS itself should have upstream at some point. Um, so I want a set of scripts that prioritizes safety and portability. So, um, you know, so ZFS seems to be, it, it's hard to tell exactly what the, what the progression of uh, progression was when the ZFS tools were being written. But it seems like excellent scaffolding for an appliance, but maybe not exactly perfect for an administrator. Um, so adding some, some basics that, uh, that protect you from yourself, that if it's 2 a.m. and you're trying to get a VM migrated because something went wrong, you want to make sure that it's safe and you're not going to make any of the mistakes that I just, uh, that I just showed. And then for the tools that I want to that I that I'd like to see, I want I want them to leverage the strengths of ZFS. So the ZFS metadata. There's we we often use you know these really long snapshot names, but but there is a creation date and there is a transaction group. You can already there is also already a lot of this a lot of this uh, stuff in there, and also um, you know ZFS properties and uh, and permissions. Setting the read only read only flag is a really good way to say this sucker's a backup. Let's not let's not mess with this except for adding snapshots to it. And then I feel like if we have the right kind of building blocks, we can create some scalability through that simplicity. And um, you know, with my with my set of scripts, I've I've replicated millions of snapshots. So it can go from you know something really convenient for backing up your laptop to um, to millions as long as we take take each uh, each missing piece and build build upon it. So here are the so so here's what I'm trying to do with uh, with Zelta my my set of replication scripts. I want to work with any data set naming schemes. As I said, the internet is chaotic. I'm a system administrator. I'm not a developer. I don't have a controlled environment. I have to work with crappy appliances. I have to work with stuff in the cloud. I have to work with um, you know, different versions of different things, old Linux, uh, OmniOS. I run into everything. And I want, a, I want a script that works uh, on, on all of them without having to install a thing. I never want to destroy data. OK, I'll let you pass the capital F. But I really want to put a mean message in about that. Um, it should always work remotely. Um, it should always work recursively. So one thing about ZFS is I've, the, like the clone command doesn't have a recursive option. So there are certain things that like, they're not exactly predictable and, uh, and consistent between the different commands. So a little bit of scaffolding around that to, to make sure that everything can work recur remotely and recursively. And then I want, a script, I want a set of scripts that detects the best available features. NetBSD, I'm sad to say, doesn't have certain send features. It doesn't have, I, I think it doesn't have lowercase c for, for sending a compressed stream, which can really save a ton of time or processor work um, when you're replicating. So the set of scripts should know when it's dealing with uh, something that might be missing a feature that you're used to using, and then apply a feature that you need. Dash 
dash w's got to go on if there's a if it's an encrypted um, if it's an encrypted stream that's coming your way. And then I want that that extensive backup mode, that that um, intermediate incrementals from the beginning mode that that checks everything, uh, even if there's inconsistencies between the data sets and the tree. And then I want a, it's 2 a.m. I have to get this thing replicated as fast as I possibly can. And then, as I said uh, in the previous slide, I want to be able to scale from small to big. So here are the building blocks. So ZFS list, I created the, the you know, recursive and remote version is Zelta match. It'll tell you the difference between those two data sets and what it'll, what, what it'll take to replicate them and get them in sync. Um, replicate a tree of data sets, ZFS send and receive. I think pretty much all of the replication tools out there um, walk through each data set to make sure that it's getting the, the latest data for each one. ZFS minus capital R, ZFS send minus capital R might miss things and it might uh, assert that it's sending properties when you don't necessarily want to do that. So it just makes sense to, uh, uh, to have a mode that's walking through and doing things more carefully. I call that Zelta backup. And then um, we want to we want to scale it up. We want to replicate tons of, uh, you know, do tons of send receive jobs on tons of data set trees. Uh, so that's basically ZFS plus XARGs. Um, we, could, we could do that, or we could use Zelta policy, which has a simple YAML style file with one, one data set name per line um, with some other configurations for, for multi-threading and some other light enhancements. And um, I'm extending all of ZFS's capabilities. I try to pass the same types of flags. And um, here, here's the usage for the, uh, the basic Zelta command. So as you, uh, you, you might be able to identify, the uh, backup and sync commands will, um, will accept the regular ZFS flags, though they might adjust them a little bit for dealing with the situation where they're walking through data sets rather than just syncing them. Um, and it'll take double dash options and, and all of that. We also have a Zelta clone, which, which I won't talk about because it's pretty simple. It's just a recursive uh, clone for recovery purposes or, um, or for backup inspection. So Zelta match. Now, I'm not going to read this whole screen, but basically there are different properties. Basically, does a snapshot exist? Um, and does the data set exist? and which is ahead and which is behind, um, we can take a look at the two, the two snapshots and basically create nine flags, just like a Unix mode, that basically can communicate exactly what we can do to get these two data sets in sync. Like, what happened? Is it new? Did we add a new, uh, new data set under the data set tree? Or did something go wrong? Was something behind? Um, did, did, we have to, did we have to roll back? Um, I'm introducing a, a concept, well, I mean, it's, it's not really introducing. Everybody does this. In order to recover without destroying data, we rename our data set, and then we, um, and then we make a clone from, that, from the point in time that we want to recover from. The reason why we do this is because there could be precious data. So even if it's a ransomware attack, you don't know if you're rolling back too far and you're missing something important. So the game time decision of destroying any, any, any data is not the time that you're doing the, the, um, the, the, the recovery operation. So ZFS rollback, honestly, I don't, really, I don't really use it except for special applications where, I, you know, where it's a fixed appliance that I intend to roll back. So here, based on, uh, I have a little chart here where based on the qualities of the two data set, I can signal whether they're up to date, uh, whether they need to replicate, or whether there's an exception that we have to deal with. So to get a ZFS list as fast as possible, we don't want to dig too far into the snapshot. You can about double the speed of your list, which really matters when you're dealing with, like I said, millions of snapshots. So we're just going to to skip across the surface and get name, GUID, and the tra transaction group. 
that's enough information to get most of what we saw in the, in the previous slide. But it's a pain. Like if you want to do this manually and you got to compare uh, different names and uh, GUIDs, it can get hairy. When bookmarks get involved, it can get worse. Um, so I tried to boil it down to uh, you know, a, a, simple, a simple command. Of course, you can use a remote SCP-like uh, format to say uh, the, the data set is somewhere else. And then provide a human readable output. Now, typically, what I, what I do with ZFS Match is use this to pipe into my, uh, my Zelta backup. Um, but, you know, but you can get human readable output. Like, what, what's going on? So, for example, I have a, a, a data set that was snapshotted on the source and replica. So we get a warning. Uh, source and target have diverged. And in that case, we'll need a, an interesting way to, uh, to recover from that. Oh, by the way, with the Zelta backup, I also use it to compare my, my backup servers. So it'll walk through all of my, all of my data sets and say, OK, here are all the VMs that are not on one, one or the other server. So that's a really useful sanity check that I do on my fleet. So next up, uh, Zelta backup. So this is ZFS send and receive with a, with a wrapper to, to add some of that, that safety and um, uh, you know, the, those safety features that I was talking about before. So for the basics, we're going to mimic all of ZFS send and receives arguments. So if you, so for the unambiguous arguments, unfortunately, there's a lowercase s, which you know does different things based on what's going, um, based on ZFS send or receive. And uh, but but, excuse me, if there's an unambiguous um, flag, then Zelta will accept it. It'll check for the best CFS version features. It'll protect the new replicas by, um, by resetting the mounts, by inheriting the mounts. Um, it'll snapshot, but, but conditionally. If there's no written data, it won't do a snapshot. It accepts control T to tell you what the status is, just like CFS uh, receive does, or send, which one does control T? I forget. Well, it works. <laughs> um, and then rather than a rollback mode, we'll, we, I added a rotate mode that, that does what we described before. We'll rename the target, and we'll, we'll use clones to complete the replication. So, And I tried to make the, the example output as human-friendly as possible. So re, re, uh, replicating how much, you know, how long, and so on. Um, some, some people in here like to use, uh, you know, pipe it through PV to get, uh, uh, to get uh, some, some pretty progress viewers, and we support that with DD and PV. Um, and then there's, of course, a verbose mode that can, that can give you a message that's similar to Zelta uh, match if there's nothing to replicate. For example, target is up to date. And... Uh, yeah, I want to demo the, the rotate a little bit uh, more because I, I think that this is something that's tricky for admins to learn because it's the, 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 um, the commands aren't exactly intuitive. Uh, but like I said, dash capital F is basically never necessary. You can, um, you can, um, you can roll back a source, you can clone and rename a source, and you absolutely can keep that... Uh, that uh, line of, of snapshots going on your backup. Um, OK, so here's, here's what it looks like. So we, of course, have to wrap it in an SSH. And then we have to specify, um, uh, we have to specify that the source, the, the source data set is different than the target data set. And of course, it's a little bit tricky to do that recursively. Um, CFS send dash capital R can do it, but there are tricky edge cases where, where it doesn't really make sense. It's just, a, it's just a pain. And then, of course, you have to rename the target, and then you have to do the same thing. You have to use dash O origin equals and then match up the origins with the, with the clones. But that basically means you're not losing any data. That means that the decision to destroy data is up to you at the right day and not during the backup operation and not during a recovery operation. So here we go. 
I add dash dash rotate, it checks for the clones, it checks for a rollback event on the source, and it replicates. Um, no more data is wasted. You don't have to do a repeated full, uh, uh, full replication to recover, uh, you know, which, which is an unfortunate side effect of using some of the different appliances and tools out there. All right, and uh, last but least um, is Zelta policy. We manage oodles of backups. So basically we've added a few other options that um, don't really fit into ZFS send and receive, but do uh, apply to doing large batches of jobs. So uh, multi-threading, automatic retries, um, and naming of, the, uh, naming of the destinations. Um, we also added a, uh, a JSON output mode so that you can uh, store, I store it in SQLite, and then um, I'll show you some Grafana snapshots and how, that, uh, how that's useful. So it's a YAML-like uh, configure, uh, configuration file. I'm not wedded to this. I'm happy to use multiple types of configuration files, a database backend uh, configuration file, and so on. But this was the easiest to write by hand. So this is, this is uh, what I did. And I have a concept called a site. And a site, basically, that's a multi-threaded group. So if you're replicating from 10 different sites, you say two threads, it'll do two sites at a time. So I think that probably makes sense because you can sort of classify a site as, as sort of one circuit. And then you can get some performance benefits by re replicating multiple at a time. And here's a sanitized real world example. So like I said, it's now I happen to make every single data set a unique name um, because I'm mostly replicating jails and VMs and uh, you know, there are a couple of Z roots which I'm happy to override. But, you know, it's, it's basically as simple as it can be. And each, each snapshot is, uh, is, the syntax highlighting is, is in black for any, particular, um, for any particular data set. And this is a data set tree. You can add a new data set there. You can remove a data set and it'll, uh, it, will, it, will not, it will not complain and it'll keep the replication, replications going. Now, I do want to say that, that even though I have a snapshot feature built into this, um, you know, I, I think that, that you know, people want to do snapshots, snapshotting in all kinds of different ways. And I don't think there should be, should be a tool that limits the snapshot naming conventions. Like, I like using VM Beehive to do, um, uh, to do snapshots and clones and stuff like that. And I want to, I want to make sure that the system doesn't really care that I'm using different snapshotting names. All right, <laughs> and here's an example of, uh, you know, of, of a, a subset of my uh, data that I've, uh, that I've collected. Um, and and this, is the, this is Zelta policy output that I um, just take the JSON, I put it directly into SQLite, I load it into Grafana, and then I can get some really useful information out of this. Now, obviously, I can look for spikes like which client's eating up a ton of data from day to day for who knows what reason. But I also can do things like look at the list times. Uh, high list time can tell you two things. Either the, pool's too, the, the pool is too full, or it can tell you that, the, um, uh, that it's time to prune, uh, that you're, you're, you're late doing your pruning. So it's, it's really useful to check in on this, you know, at least, at least once, a, once a week. And of course, I get alerts. Um, if anything looks, uh, looks like it's going wrong. <clears throat> so looking ahead, I don't know if these uh, ideas need to be upstream, but I think they should be standardized at least. So a concept of how to communicate an endpoint format. I mean, I think the most obvious format that we could use is Something like um, something like SCP. So user at host colon pool. Now of course a colon. Well, not of course. You might you might know or might not know. A colon can actually be part of a ZFS name. So uh, you need to specify the host if if your naming gets weird. But but this is a pretty good and pretty intuitive way to describe an endpoint. Um, uh, a, a standardized way to communicate uh, whether whether two uh, data sets are replicas of each other that the two are the two are related to each other. 
So like I was, like I was mentioning a, a permission mode concept or I don't know, a, uh, you know, a sync code or, or something like that, it would be nice to have a standard language that we had to say these are, these are out of sync, this one's behind the other one. Um, I had trouble coming up with the uh, terminology that really worked for, for that, those kinds of ideas. And then smarter uh, detection of replication features. The best way I figured out how to tell if, uh, if one host had a ZFS send option versus another one is just get the usage output from, from the ZFS send command. Uh, Zpool version doesn't quite give it to you because it, it might not tell you that dash lowercase c works or um, some other things. So it's really hard to predict which, you know, a machine that you just SSH'd into, you know, without, you know, basically crashing the ZFS send command, what, what, it, uh, what its capabilities are. So some smarter way to do that. If I'm wrong about any of that, that's great. Please correct me. I would love to, love to know how to do it better. Um, so yeah, and looking forward, I, I think, uh, you know, Zelta is a, is a useful script. I hope it has some, some good ideas. You can see that there's, uh, you know, like Zelta endpoint will help explode the endpoint into a uh, tab list. Uh, uh, Zelta send ops will show, um, show the options between, uh, between two hosts. Uh, but uh, yeah, I think I would, it would, I, I think there's a, there's a lot, a lot of good we could have. I mean, I hear a lot of people saying, oh, I made, you know, we all make our own ZFS replication tools. Yeah, great. Let's see them. Let's see how we can solve these things, uh, you know, together and get them, get them upstream. And, um, you know, the other thing that I think a lot of us can do in this room is, is build our own appliances, make our own, uh, make our own systems. Uh, you know, we, we know that, uh, that IX, they, they earn about $100 million in revenue. Uh, Datto makes about seven times that. Um, but these are small fries. The, uh, the smallest cloud, like a small cloud provider, Google Cloud Platform, makes about $10 billion a year on storage. Everybody needs storage. We all need to get our stuff somewhere safely. Um, so by collaborating together, we can, um, there's, there's a lot of good we can do. Uh, yeah, so that's it. Any questions about my product or my pessimism? All right. Right. Yeah. 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 Yes. Oh, right. Yeah. So, um, so someone in the audience was uh, was reiterating the point that I was making about, um, you know, how to how we often shoot ourselves in the foot with uh, uh, with with CFS. And yeah, I think, I think the, the answer to that is a lot of people have their own, you know, their own ideas and their own scripts um, on how to do that, on, you know, how to, how to avoid these problems. And we should be, we should be really sharing these so that we can, we can get the, we can compete and find the best solutions between us. Yes. Uh, so if you, okay, so the the question is that uh, the the versions of Zelta are, are absolutely in flux. Yeah, that's uh, so the the man pages are available in the latest main branch. Um, so and they they the, the man pages actually work, and it's quite similar to the wiki. If you go to zelta.space, there's a there's a there's a wiki there um, that's that I think refers almost entirely to the to the version that's in the main branch now. Um, 
I am still trying to get the demand pages cleaned up and get some examples in there. Um, but I, am, I do have a, a professional help, somebody working uh, for me that's continuously testing this on various operating systems. And it, it, does seem, it does seem pretty solid. But yeah, I would go with the, I would go with the latest. Yeah, so FreeBSD, yeah, the FreeBSD ports are, are definitely behind what I'm, what I'm working on. And the, the biggest thing that I've been working on um, is, is the documentation, is the point of use documentation, which I think is honestly probably the most critical feature to have in a, you know, in, in a replication suite. I added a dash N flag or a dash dash dry run flag for everything. So you can use Zelta not only as a potential replication suite, but also as a learning tool to show you what, what efficient versions of the commands, or at least my idea of the efficient versions of the commands are. So, you know, that, that, that was one of my hopes for the project, is I, could, is I could use it to help train my staff on some of these more complicated CFS features. Oh, what OS is? <laughs> so uh, someone asked, um, what OSs am I supporting? I am supporting everything but Windows right now. Um, so, and that's only because Windows doesn't have awk. So, uh, in order to design this this uh, project, what I wanted to do is make it absolutely run anywhere ZFS could run. So, I continuously test on FreeBSD and Debian. And I, I do a little bit of the, the writing on Mac OS. So um, I also test a bit on OmniOS. Um, so it should, it should work pretty much, uh, pretty much anywhere. And I want to know if it doesn't. If it doesn't work on OmniOS, I'd like to know, I'd like to know why. Like some of the error messages are, are a bit different there. Are you testing it on the Windows subsystem for Linux? Uh, yes. Uh, the question is, am I testing on Windows subsystem for Linux? And yes, we do have, uh, we are testing actively on that, both uh, with, uh, um, I, I believe mostly with Ubuntu, and then we're using Debian Jails and, and Beehive uh, are the two, two main Linuxes we're working on now. Um, I have tested with all three versions, well, the three, three major versions of, of Awk, so it does work. I lint in Gawk. Um, and uh, Debian, I think certain versions, like the no cloud version, come with mock installed. So I had some run-ins with some up upstream bugs with, with that sucker, but, uh, but it, it, should, it should work pretty much anywhere now. Yes. Right. Sure. Yeah. So the question is, um, how do you deal with uh, compression when your when your backup environment is much more compressed than your source environment? Um, so there is a there is a file called zelta.env to uh, suggest the defaults chosen um, options. If you drop C from from that list or you over, overwrite the environment variable, uh, you can you can modify you can modify any default. You can you can modify the SSH command that's called. So we do provide um, some some flexibility for for dealing with that sort of thing. Of course, that's a that's a that's a natural um, you know that that's that's something that I've done a lot of is is you know compressed much more highly with my uh, with my backup server. So I, I was I was I definitely uh, needed a switch to to deal with that particular problem. Right, because the source could be the source could be a bookmark. So I needed to see the GUIDs to to ensure that I'm using the the the, the best common snapshot between the source and target. Okay. 
Can I use GUIDs to track data set renames? I mean, I think you might know better than me. <laughs> um, Right. Absolutely. Yeah, that's that's a great that's a great point. I'm going to add that to issues. So the question is, so if a so if I'm if I'm uh, if I'm synchronizing a data set, some of its children might have had their uh, might have been renamed. So does Zelta handle a situation where they've changed, or will it re-replicate them? And right now, it'll it will almost certainly re-replicate them. But there's no need for that because I could uh, I could actually uh, get that uh, get that in memory somewhere so that doesn't happen. That's an interesting feature. I I, I love that idea, and I think that uh, uh, you know I mean it's it's something that happens quite frequently. I have to rename. You know, or I want to rename it. I have a, uh, I have a VM, and I called the drive boot, and it's not. You know, I added a different drive, and now it's not boot anymore. I want to rename it. I certainly don't want to re-replicate the whole thing. Um, so right now, I would have to rename on all all replicas, which would be a pain. You're right. There would be an absolutely easy way to uh, to to resolve exactly that problem. Yes. How much of what Zelda does do you think like should be easy if there's just like these are the same default or something? Like how much of it is like, you know, this is policy or this is, you know, uh, say cost management or this is something that isn't real easy if it's just small as such. Like do you have a do you sort of split your mind about that? Right. This this is a great question. So the the question is what what parts of Zelta that are that are making sort of assumptions about safe what it, what it considers safe defaults versus what ZFS should think of as safe defaults. So I think that dash capital L for ZFS uh, send dash capital L the, the large blocks option. This is not good if you don't use dash capital L because it's going to it's going to stack the replica up in you know an extremely inefficient way on 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 the on the backup, um, but that is a sensible default because we don't want ZFS to fail in uh, in a situation where where it's an ancient version of ZFS and doesn't have dash L. So uh, I guess I guess this is a tough question. I mean, this would be this would be a great question if you're if you're going to join us um, for the birds of a feather. I think this this would be a great first thing to talk about because I do think it's a I do think it's a complex question. Like like, are, should the defaults of ZFS be the absolute safest, most likely to work ones? And maybe the answer to that is yes. And ZFS should have a dash dash. Uh, detect flags or something option to, to deal with those types of situations. Yes. The best correct answer to it is to actually have ability in ZFS for ZFS send not to be unidirectional. To have ability to have like ZFS receive key nodes and ZFS send can communicate and they can negotiate the conversion, the flags. <laughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> the the best answer was to have ZFS uh, be able to negotiate um, sort of critical options um, as part of its as part of its uh, as part of its replication, which I think uh, is that's a that's a pretty good solution. Yeah. Also, just something to you know, some some consistent standard way to pull. But then, I guess both of these both of these solutions do have the problem of, you know, what do we do about what do we do about older versions, which you know, as long as there are appliances, we're gonna we're gonna have to get stuff off of them. All right. 
Anything else? I mean, we'll probably have a lot more ZFS to talk about, but we can do that in 10 minutes, I think. Yeah. <laughs> All right. All right, let's do it. Thanks.